Hi, everybody. I'm so glad you're here today. Um, we, um, my name is Lisa Del Bono, and I'm one of the CCL state coordinators for Michigan, and I co-lead the health action team along with Lori and Rob Byron. Today, we have the good fortune to hear from, I hope, three outstanding panelists, one of, yes, I think she made it, great, um, about how certain communities have been disproportionately impacted by air pollution and how climate change is po poised to worsen air quality in many places across the US and how those same communities are being disproportionately impacted by other aspects of the changing climate. We plan to start by having each speaker tell us a little bit about themselves, and then I have a handful of questions to get the discussion rolling, and hopefully we will end up with a fair bit of time for audience Q&A. If you're online, just put your questions in the Q&A section, and if you're in DC, please write your questions on the index card, and then they will be put in the computer in the Q&A section for us to read. If we can't get to them to all of them, we will try to answer them after the fact uh, in a written form. So to begin with, I want to tell you about her, about Dr. Yvonne Collins. She's a practicing GYN oncologist, which for the audience means that she is a surgeon and a cancer doctor who treats malignancies that affect the female reproductive system. She's the chief medical officer of County Care within the Cook County Hospital and Health System. In addition to a busy practice, Dr. Collin has devoted her career to educating underserved women on the importance of routine health maintenance. She works with community organizations, area churches, beauty salons, and task force on developing ways to decrease racial disparities related to cervical cancer, which is essentially a preventable form of cancer. She has provided healthcare in the US and traveled abroad to Central America, the Caribbean, Asia, and Africa. Her honors include being named Outstanding Teacher not once, but twice, and Humanitarian of the Year. Currently, she's serving as one of the Health Equity Fellows for the Medical Society on Climate and Health. Avon, you have taught and traveled and practiced around the world. Can you start out by telling us how you became interested in climate change and why you chose to take time out of your incredibly demanding uh, practice to um, become a, a fellow with a consortium and how that relates to CCL? Absolutely. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Um, I do want to let everybody know that, I, as Lisa said, I am a Climate and Health, Health Equity Fellow, and I do receive a stipend from them, uh, but really it goes deeper than that. Um, my why is I attended college in New Orleans, um, and when in one of my ethics, ethics classes, we began to learn about an area that was called Cancer Alley. It's an 85-mile area that extends from New Orleans to Baton Rouge, and the vast majority of that population 46% are African-American. Also in that area, 16% of that population were those living in poverty. If you look at the right side graphic, it doesn't do it justice, but there are 150 refineries and plants in that one in that 85 mile radius. So imagine all of the toxicity, not only in the air, but in the soil and in the water. Um, and so take it one step further, um, we, we started to talk about environmental justice and injustice, and that was an absolutely great example. I then went to residency. I'm an, uh, trained in OBGYN initially, and we saw the impacts that really the environment in, in general had on our patients in terms of mold, in terms of water contamination, in terms of lead. So again, compounded the fact of environmental injustice. Um, and take it one step further, uh, my cousin was then diagnosed with breast cancer and they attributed a portion of it, not necessarily to the genetic part, but to some environmental factors based on where she worked. I continued working and then began to see the connection between climate and environmental injustice and decided that that I wanted to take an active role in being a, a, a solution to the problem as opposed to the problem. Um, and so the fellowship is my way to get to that end in terms of learning some more. I like CCL from the perspective, I researched a lot of groups uh, from the perspective that there was a health task force and we could really begin to tie in not only for the community, but also for some of our colleagues who still don't understand the connection between climate and health and equity. Um, so in a long story, that is my why. 
apply. And um, I, I, my hope is that at the end of this, I can add to my resume um, that I made an impact on changing the lives for the vulnerable who are indeed affected by climate and inequities. That's a beautiful story. And I have no doubt that you absolutely will be able to say that. So our next panelist who's made it through bad weather and uh, a tight schedule is Dr. Rachel Licker. She is a principal climate scientist with the Climate and Energy Program at the Union of Concerned Scientists. And in her role, she provides strategic thinking and technical and analytic expertise across the organization. But prior to joining the UCS, she completed an AAAS, which is American Association for Advancement of Science and Technology Policy Fellowship. And during that time, she are, she also completed her postdoctorate training at Princeton University's Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. During that time, she served as a chapter scientist and contributing author to the IPCC's working group, the second working group. I have had the good fortune to work with Dr. Licker in the past, and I know her to be an excellent communicator and just a genuinely kind person. In fact, on Twitter, Rachel refer, describes herself as a climate scientist interested in knocking down walls and building bridges. She says, let's all be friends again. So I can't think of a more CCL-like statement. Can you do the same, uh, Rachel, as Yvonne just did, and tell us a bit about how you first got interested in climate change and why you chose to work with UCS? Sure, my pleasure. Um, I hope, can you hear me okay? Yep. Can you hear me okay? Okay, yes. great. I apologize. Um, I am joining you from my telephone. I uh, We are in the middle of a very severe thunderstorm and I lost complete power uh, in my there's a tree that fell in the power lines at my neighbor. So this is really scrappy. I really apologize, but I'm glad I can get to you all. <laughs> um, so yeah, in the middle of a climate related hazard as we, as we speak right now. Um, yeah, so I'm joining you from Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, and I uh, my path kind of to being a climate scientist at UCS, um, I had actually way, 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 way back been really interested in animal welfare um, and got really interested in animal behavior. And then when I was in college, realized that the best pathway to protecting animals was actually from where I was in that part of my life, thinking about habitat um, preservation and realized then that one of the greatest threats to habitats and animals was climate change. Um, and so I went on to study the issue in my doctorate um, and started to really think not just about animals, but about people um, and realizing, you know, everyone who is at threat uh, because of the issue. Um, and so I was really studying it from a food security perspective uh, in my PhD program here at Wisconsin, um, but felt like I just wanted to get out of academia and do something about the issue. Um, and so what I did next, I did a postdoc. I was lucky to be in a public affairs school and got involved in the IPCC report, which kind of gave me a an exit just a path where I got to start assessing science for policymakers, uh, then went on to the Department of State where I got to work initially under the Obama administration uh, on providing environmental finance to developing countries to meet their commitments to different treaties and conventions. Um, I'm trying to use the computer light to uh, have some <laughs> illumination in the dark here. Um, and then after that, um, you know, Trump got elected and I really just felt out of step with uh, <laughs> the policies that were being enacted at the State Department felt I really couldn't stay. Uh, and so I saw my job listing for UCS uh, felt like the threat of uh, to science and our democracy in addition to the work they were doing on climate change uh, was just a really exciting opportunity to try to help elevate, um, again, science evidence in in our decision-making process and get to really work on fighting uh, for climate action so we can make headway. Um, so yeah, I, my current position, I do work on our climate impacts team doing research uh, on extreme heat and other sort of uh, climate related hazards. I do work on um, attributing different climate impacts to corporate actors such as fossil fuel companies to help hold them accountable um, and do general communication and strategic thinking um, and really excited to be here and to be able to be here. So thank you for the opportunity, Lisa. 
Oh, Rachel, thank you for making it. And if at any point you have to go, we completely understand. Thank you. Um, and I think it, it, so don't think twice about it. Um, Brian, I think you might, uh, do you mind putting our emails in the in the chat in case people have questions that they want to email to us directly? Um, and now I'm going to go to our third uh, uh, panelist, uh, Ms. Priscilla Talley, who I think many of you may already know. She's a climate activist, a writer, and a fellow at large at the Op-Ed Project, which is an organization whose mission is, and I love this, to change who writes history to change who writes history. I think that's great. And as a fellow at large, her role includes fellowship coaching and facilitation. Previously, she was a public health, public voices fellow with the Op-Ed Project and the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication. And during the 2020 fellowship year, she, her op-eds and commentary on climate on the climate crisis reached over 1 million readers and was published in more than 10 publications. Previously, Princella worked as the Development and Diversity Outreach Coordinator for CCE, Citizens Climate Education, and she started our Climate and Culture Action. So Princella, we know you are a longtime CCLer and we're grateful for the work you've done in broadening CCL's perspective. Um, and I'd like to just ask you the same question. How did you become passionate about climate change? And can you tell us a little bit about Jenny's story to kind of set the stage for the rest of the discussion? I sure can. It's so nice to be back in the room at CCL. So hi to everyone, even if I can't see you. So it was by chance that I was introduced to climate change and I was ghostwriting actually for a business client. And that topic was climate change and its effects on the global supply chain. So in doing the research for that project, I thought, oh, okay, wow, this, this thing called climate change affects everything around me. It affects everyone I know, and it affects me, and it has affected me for a long time. So I immediately became concerned about it. And then I watched An Inconvenient Truth. I know that's a story a lot of us share. And in watching that, I was even more concerned. But then I felt more so called to action. So I was participating mostly in protest, going back to what Dr. Collins mentioned in Cancer Alley, because I'm in Louisiana. And I was also longing for something local. So I searched online, I found CCL and the possibility of starting a chapter. Now the bipartisan approach was a really difficult concept for me to process initially, but I just find it important as a person to be more of yes and in my thinking instead of isolating myself to one perspective. So it took me some time, but I leaned in and I stayed in that learning process to work in different ways on this issue. So I started in this work as a writer, and that's the best way I work to have an impact on this crisis and continuing to support other people in their climate activism journeys. So when I wrote the story of Jenny, it was something that I posted on my blog uh, yesterday, actually. And it's a personal story, not just kind of stretching my creative muscles a bit, but also showing that you can approach urgent issues from a variety of angles, including artistically. So Jenny's story is a true story about how pollution can affect a person, how it can affect a community, even when they don't realize pollution is the cause of their ailments. And it also speaks to the important acknowledgement that without swift actions that are going to reduce pollution and without the knowledge from people who are surviving environmental violence, there are so many lives that will continue to be lost and continue to be at stake. Uh, it's a beautiful story, and I hope you get a chance to read it. Maybe we can put that in the chat as well. Um, now, what I want to do is turn to the topic of today's discussion, air pollution and its relationship to climate impacts. And if Rachel's there, um, I'd like to begin with you this time and just ask you to uh, tell us a little bit about the basic science of air pollution and climate change. What's the difference between air pollutants and greenhouse gases? And how are ozone and fine particulate matter formed? And what happens to ozone concentration when temperatures rise? Sure. Um, yeah, so there are certainly different ways that climate change and air quality intersect. Um, and some uh, air pollutants are really, I guess, you could say all greenhouse gases, <laughs> how do I put it? 
so, you know, some air pollutants are greenhouse gases and some aren't, I guess is maybe the easiest way to boil it down. So starting, for example, with ground level ozone, um, it forms more easily as temperatures increase, um, which is obviously happening as climate changes. Um, and, you know, we know that ground level ozone is harmful to human health, which we're certainly going to be hearing um, more about from my panelists um, as we move forward. Um, Another important issue is that as fossil fuels are burned, in addition to greenhouse gases, other types of pollutants called particulate, particulate matter um, are formed, which are also harmful to human health, as we'll, we'll hear more about. Um, and air pollutants can affect climate too. Um, in some instances, for example, air pollutants can act as greenhouse gases trapping heat. So that's the case, for example, with ground level ozone pollution. Um, and in other instances, there are types of air pollution that can be bad for human health, but serve to cool the planet a, a bit. Um, but it's really important to say that on balance, we know that the combustion of fossil fuels is definitely the main driver of global warming. Um, so even if there's a little bit of fossil fuel combustion that uh, you know, causes an aerosol that is cooling by and large, absolutely the combustion of fossil fuels is warming the planet. Great, thanks for that background, Rachel. Um, Yvonne, as a practicing physician, I'm sure you're well aware of the numerous credible studies that estimate that fine particulate air pollution contributes to about one in five or six premature deaths worldwide and one in about 10 to 20 premature deaths in the US every single year. And according to the 2020 State of the Global Air Report, air pollution contributed to approximately 500 deaths of infants in their first months of life worldwide. What types of health impacts of air pollution do you see in your practice and what impacts are your colleagues seeing? Thank you for that, Lisa. Um, I'm, I'm going to skip this slide because Rachel did a really good job of, of looking at where that primary air pollution comes from. So in terms of ozone, in terms of pollen, in terms of particulate matter. But when we look really at what kind of diseases we are seeing, they're vast. Um, in my patient population, uh, we can attribute um, headaches, an increase in headaches directly related to air pollution. Um, there's a lot of just irritation, so itchy eyes, runny nose, sore throat, um, cough. What I do want to highlight is, although we are starting to see really um, significant decreases in lung cancer, there are some very particular populations where we're seeing that number either stabilize or increase. And and those are the lung cancers that are probably directly associated with the air pollution um, that we're seeing. But now there's also been, been a tie to cardiovascular disease and impact on liver and spleen and your reproductive system. Um, so as an OBGYN, as we counsel patients um, on the importance of, of knowing where they live and the environment they in, they're in, we know that there's a direct correlation with preterm births. We know that there's a direct correlation with low births. We know there's a direct correlation with women being unable to get pregnant um, due to that air, uh, air pollution. So there are substantial health effects that are associated with it. But what I want the audience also to understand is that the impact continues to grow. And the estimate is that now, between now and 2030, we'll see an additional 250,000 premature deaths due to air pollution, where in a lot of cases we could prevent it. And we'll talk about that a little later. Uh, but the health effects are real. I worry about it as a surgeon, because if you have a patient that's constantly coughing after an abdominal incision, it also increases a, the risk of basically disruption of that surgical incision. Um, so the um, effects are vast, I would say, Lisa. Boy, thanks so much. Um, that's really <laughs> sets the stage. Um, Princella, your writing beautifully uh, illustrates how certain populations have been disproportionately impacted in a variety of ways. And research confirms this. In the 2022 State of the Air report from the American Lung Association, they found that people of color were 3.6 times more likely to live in counties with failing grades of air pollution. So they breathe more frequently air polluted air. And um, the HEAL project or the Health Equity Advancement and Leadership Project quotes literature that finds that Black Americans are five times more likely to visit the ER because of asthma. Can you tell me more about what you've learned and been able to highlight in some of your articles about air pollution? Sure, so I'll go back in time a little bit um, to when I looked at that intersectionality of air pollution with other inequities. 
So it was the 2021 State of the Air report for me from the American Lung Association. And it found that in the city of Columbus, Ohio, particle pollution had gotten worse. And that particle pollution, pollution, you know, it gets stuck in your lungs, causing asthma, cancer, strokes, variety of other ailments. And that particle pollution comes from sources, including power plants and the diesel emissions. So I'm not from Columbus. I can't speak to this community that I'm going to reference, but based on research I did, there was a long, uh, year long, year long investigative study about the problems and the possibilities within the specific community named Linden. So in the Linden neighborhood, community residents there, they have more chronic health issues and mental health issues than other areas in that state. So from 2013 to 2017, it was found that of every 1,000 births in Linden, 18 babies died. And babies have been twice as likely to die before their first birthday if they lived in Linden. And so while the emissions from driving and vehicles make air pollution in Columbus worse, the Linden neighborhood residents were also lacking necessary access to transportation systems to get themselves and their children to health appointments and to get to work. So I look at the demographics there and I'm looking at the full circle that's forming. And while people of color, they were made the face of the disparities in, these, in this neighborhood, the demographics were also dissected. It was dissected into North Linden and South Linden, North Linden being predominantly white, South Linden being predominantly black. But this would also show that the impacts of that air pollution and the related disparities are being felt across racial lines in that region. So eventually, other communities nationwide are going to bear this burden regardless of race. And I think that's something to keep in mind. So Linden and the health of residents and what's happening with the babies, this is a prime example of how curbing those sources of pollution and supporting people during these transitions is actually an immediate matter of life and death. It's beautiful. Can Marcella. I add something? Sure, sure, please do. Yeah, as we and, and thank you very, very much for that, Priscilla, because I, I think it just adds on when we talk about redlining and the community communities where redlining has definitely had an effect, we know that those then become communities where implant, I mean, uh, plants are put, where um, water may be contaminated, where soil is an issue, uh, where we're less likely to talk about measures to prevent all of the effects of climate change, and where they substantially bear the burden in a lot of cases uh, for climate change. Um, so when we, when we look at the racial disparity um, of climate change is real. Um, and, and thank you, Priscilla, for that. But I just wanted to, you know, look at when we would redlining is a, a key example, especially in Chicago, we can draw distinct lines of communities and see whatever health burden you want to look at, there are distinct differences in those populations. Absolutely. And can I build on a little Lisa to please do go for it. Great. Um, something that comes to my mind, being on that local level, when we talk about redlining and all these things that happen locally across the country. When you think about what happened um, in Linden, what still happens, and you think about how we do want to create these transitions on a local level, but also on a larger scale, thinking about those smart city transitions from an equity lens is so important because in Columbus, when they had that, I think it was $50 million, and I'm sorry if I'm a little off on that number, in funding in 2016, to start that transition with data and technology from an equity lens, what started to happen was well, that infant mortality rate has dropped three years in a row now. And while mm -hmm. there is still the issue of particle pollution, air quality overall has improved in Columbus. So my main learning there from writing about that is that yes, we have to push for that national legislation that lowers emissions, but we can't overlook or neglect those immediate actions that can save lives right now on a local scale from co-designed urban planning where citizens are working with local government officials. Well, thank you for that. And I'm glad that you just jumped in. Um, and I think one thing we might wanna do is go back and talk a little bit about what redlining is. I think many people probably already know in, the, in, the, um, in our audience, but it's the historic situation in which back in the 1930s, there was um, variation in the ability of different uh, populations to be able to get mortgages. And they separated cities into different colors the red lines being the red communities being uh, quote, the less desirable. And as a color, there were four different 
um, gradations. But what's really interesting about that, and I wanted to bring it out in this discussion, was that those changes back in the 1930s are still being played out today in terms of health. And so I would like to go through that a little bit, and, and I'm going to go to those questions next. But I also want to uh, emphasize the point that Princella uh, just made. We've mentioned that um, that uh, Yvonne is a fellow with Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health. And many of us who are on the CCL's health action team are actually working with the consortium as well. And there are state affiliates to the consortium. Yvonne's active in the Illinois one. I'm active in um in the Michigan one, there's one in Wisconsin, and, and there are about 23, 24, 25, they'd like to get them across the country. And one of the things that we're looking at very specifically is uh, the, the bipartisan infrastructure package. As that money comes down from the federal government, how can we as health professionals have an impact on the state and local level to make sure that the implementation of that money really is with an equity lens? So I really appreciate the comments that you just made, Priscilla. And frankly, I have a lot to learn to, to understand how we can do that, but I think it's an important part of the puzzle. We have to look at both. So in terms of redlining, I did want to go over to Rachel then next. We know that several studies have demonstrated how the urban heat island effect impacts traditionally redlined communities. And cooling tree canopies tend to be more prevalent in more affluent areas at the edge of urban areas. Uh, in addition, a recent Union of Concerned Scientists report called Killer Heat in the U.S., also highlighted how outdoor workers, particularly immigrant workers, suffer extremely challenging work conditions, made even worse with extreme heat. Could you help us understand both of these issues just a bit better? Yeah, sure. Well, I think you laid out in many respects that, oh, okay. Um, I think you laid out the issue with respect to the urban heat island um, you know, quite well um, that we know that uh, I mean, the communities that are most disproportionately affected by that issue, um, you know, and again, the issue is that uh, in areas in, you know, a city center, they tend to be hotter than the surrounding areas because of a few different reasons, including that, you know, the, the lack of trees providing shade and um, you know, sheltering residents from extreme heat, uh, in addition to kind of the we call it the urban canyon. So it's actually, you know, hot air can get trapped um, in there. Uh, the asphalt is absorbing the heat and then it gets re-radiated back out at night. So a variety of different factors contribute to urban centers um, being hotter than their surrounding areas. And then those residents um, tend to, you know, then be not only exposed to uh, an extreme heat event happening over an area when they occur, but then it's compounded by the urban heat island effects. So it's kind of a double whammy. So then when you look at the, you know, who tends to live in those areas that have less tree cover, you know, those tend to be low income communities, communities of color that then get disproportionately affected um, by an extreme heat event. Uh, and, you know, then also it, compounding all sorts of other um, vulnerabilities and risks um, to those populations. Um, and so, uh, you know, what we were finding in our work is that those extreme heat events are likely to occur uh, more frequently across much of the country as the century progresses. Um, and we did an analysis in which we looked at one of the most exposed groups and that's outdoor workers to extreme heat. Um, and that's because of the nature of the, their job that they're doing. Um, we know that uh, outdoor workers disproportionately identify as Hispanic, Latino, Black and African-American. Um, and we looked at scenarios of what would happen under different global warming and adaptation uh, scenarios. And so what we found was that without action on climate change um, by mid-century, so not all too far off in the future, outdoor workers uh, could risk losing about 54 point, uh, 55, excuse me, $0.4 billion per year in earnings, uh, just the outdoor workers alone themselves um, because of extreme heat exposure. Um, so the extreme heat creating unsafe work conditions. And so um, again, because we know that those workers disproportionately identify as 
Hispanic, Latino, Black, and African American, those workers would thus disproportionately be at risk of losing earnings because of unsafe work conditions due to extreme heat. Um, and so, you know, we see all of these different issues colliding with one another because of uh, and getting increasingly exacerbated because of climate change. Um, and you know, it's just a really uh, that there are people dying because of this. Um, and then, you know, we see situations in which there's just a complete lack of support for policies across party lines. It's really uh, maddening is one word for it, um, you know, because some of the policies that could help protect workers are really just sheer ethics. I mean, it's about providing these workers with access to clean water, shade, humane work conditions. Um, and so it's the same for, you know, the places that people are living. It's about providing people not just with humane work conditions but, and humane living conditions, but the ability to thrive. Um, and so, you know, obviously we see that ability not equal, uh, you know, across the United States. And so these are a couple of ways, unfortunately, in which that's manifesting under the climate crisis. Um, thanks for those that that depiction, and it's really helpful to us because what we'll be doing over the next few weeks is we'll meet with all of our members of Congress on both sides of the aisle, and so being able to articulate some of this will be very ho helpful, I think. Um, Avon, if if uh, you could speak to what clinicians are actually seeing in their clinics during an extreme heat event like the one playing out right now in the U.S., that would be wonderful. There have been articles I know that discuss the relationship of extreme heat and air pollution to pregnancy outcome. And so maybe you can tell us a little bit more about reproductive justice issues and how the International Federation of GYN, on college, uh, GYN and Obstetrics obstetrics approaches climate and health. Bye, go. <laughs> and you're muted. Yep, so I'll start with um, extreme heat just to give folks a sense of the body is really amazing. So if you look at, at the bottom right, what happens when we're in extreme heat is we begin to sweat. Some even sweat profusely. Uh, we lose a lot of fluid. We then become dehydrated. That dehydration leads to an array of abnormal changes in the body. Um, you can see that when we look at what those effects are, there are effects that are directly related to health. So like I said, dehydration, um, um, heat cramps, heat stroke, but also when we think about our bodies, there are hospitalizations that are related to really the entire system. So you have problems breathing. Um, if you have diabetes because of the fluid loss, your diabetes is exacerbated uh, because of the dehydration. Also, we've seen patients actually go into renal failure and require dialysis. We know extreme heat is directly related to stroke, but also there's a lot of literature that also points to the mental health. And, and you think about it, the heat rage, um, people become less patient um, and, and really a lot more violent in the midst of extreme heat. Um, what's not on this slide, but I definitely wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about is really that obstetrical component. We know when we look at heat, and again, if we look at the African American or the Latin population, there's a large proportion of workers that are outside workers that are pregnant workers. So they may not be outside, they may be in cleaners, and we've seen direct effects of both of those related to pregnancy. And that's where FIGO came up with their statement related not only to environmental justice, um, but also really reproductive justice. As Lisa said, we've seen direct correlates that there are neurodevelopmental effects that are related to heat and toxins, that the babies are born at less birth weight, um, that women cannot carry pregnancies to term. Um, they are at increased risk for gestational diabetes due to all of those effects. So when we look at it, really just changing or planning um, related to heat makes a substantial difference. And that's where, again, I think legislation and advocacy becomes really important. Can we build in breaks? Can we change schedules so that when the most vulnerable are working, they have an, an, an opportunity to maybe not work during those high risk times, but we know that there are direct effects related also to heat, um, that if we can plan appropriate, we can, we can decrease some of those unexpected deaths. That's the number one cause of death when we look at climate change related activities. Um, behind air pollution, it's, it's heat, extreme heat, and deaths related to heat. Mm. Mm. 
And again, it plays out disproportionately. Um, Priscilla, you have written extensively about health and environmental dis disparities and how uh, Black women have suffered disproportionately from COVID-19 and climate impacts and how the homeless are particularly vulnerable in extreme weather events. Could you tell us more about what you've learned in investigating these stories and if, it, if these disparities correlate with historic uh, redlined communities? Okay, great. Yeah, so I had there were a lot of learnings for me looking at those correlations, Lisa. So where do I start? Where do I start? Thinking about the homeless, that's uncomfortable. And being homeless is not a monolithic experience, right? We have the unsheltered homeless, the people living on the streets and abandoned buildings, et cetera. People who are sheltered homeless, they do have access to safer indoor uh, spaces. So the unsheltered homeless, they're undoubtedly experiencing the worst of extreme weather events and pollution because their bodies are constantly on the line and their bodies are the only barriers they have from extreme weather. So worldwide, if weather disasters are leaving up to 20 million people a year homeless and then more than 500,000 people in the US alone are experiencing homelessness, 64% of them being unsheltered, then what happens if it's projected that deaths from air pollution double by 2050 if we don't do something. And once again, the unsheltered homeless, the number is increasing there, they're going to bear that greatest burden. And this isn't spotlighted as much as it should be. And there are less discussions around climate solutions that include those federal and state investments that fund placement services for the unsheltered homeless. And I think, I have a hunch that it's because Obviously, this is a very visible yet invisible population. And this is when we get into those conversations about who's at the table. Now, a lot of people who are homeless, be it sheltered or unsheltered, they don't have the time or capacity in most cases to engage in what climate solutions could look like. And because they can't sit at those tables with us, it's easier to turn away from the uncomfortable reality that homelessness exists and how those severe weather impacts are affecting people in those circumstances. So another uncomfortable reality that we know of at this point, a lot of us do, is between the climate crisis and deadly viruses like COVID and how that is colliding with race and gender and ethnicity and the determining factors of who lives and who dies. So me as a black woman, when I go to the hospital seeking treatment and I'm discriminated against, and those race-based myths are out there that my skin is tougher, I can wait longer in the emergency room or that I'm just exaggerating, my life is even more at stake again. So those are some of my major learnings from that. Mm. Wow. And I think there's actually a uh, correlation uh, between air pollution and the degree of particulate matter and, and COVID deaths again. So another, another example. Um, so CCL, everyone here knows, CCL works really hard to encourage co Congress to take meaningful action on climate change, hopefully in a bipartisan way, right? So one important step, Rachel, to reducing emissions and cleaning up the air is electrifying everything. But my understanding is that it's also critically important to power those electric engines with a decarbonized grid. And to that end, the Union of Concerned Scientists recently issued a report on the road to 100% renewables. Can you tell us a little bit more about why decarbonizing the grid is so important and about that report? Sure. Um, I'm going to start with the first point about the importance of decarbonizing everything. Um, so decarbonizing the power grid um, is crucial because the main solutions for cutting emissions, <laughs> as we're talking about, and other economic sectors, such as transportation and buildings or homes and cars, involves converting them to run on electricity. Um, so we therefore need to have clean energy resources ready to power these sectors um, so we don't keep perpetuating the issue of global warming. Um, because you know all of that would increase the demand for electricity so we and you know we also therefore need to be as energy efficient as possible um so with respect to our new report um we looked at the feasibility and the implications of the 24 member states of the united states climate alliance meeting 100 uh, of their electricity needs 
by, uh, with renewable energy um, by 2035. And we analyzed two main scenarios. Uh, we looked at business as usual uh, versus 100% renewable electricity standards. Um, and what we found was that the Climate Alliance states can indeed meet 100% of their electricity consumption with renewables by 2035. And this holds true uh, even with strong increases in demand due to the electrification of transportation and heating. Um, we also looked at how this kind of transition would affect public health and the economy and found tremendous benefits actually compared to a no new policy scenario. Um, and so, you know, the last point, and just kind of really speaking at a high level about this report, um, is that to ensure an equitable transition, we are really emphasizing that states need to uh, have provide broad access to clean energy technologies, as well as decision making to include environmental justice and fossil fuel dependent communities while directly phasing out coal and fossil fuel plants. Um, so really ensuring that these communities, again, are able to have uh, access, um, are able to be at the table um, so that we don't keep replicating the same problems that we've been making on this front. Um, and yeah, so I'll, I'll stop there and turn Great. it back to Lisa. Sure. So um, Yvonne, just today, the American Medical Association passed a resolution declaring climate change a, a quote, public health crisis, but addressing it also provides an opportunity for immediate health co-benefits. That's the good news part of all this. And to that end, uh, some of the people in the audience will know Dr. Jonathan Patz and his colleagues. They recently uh, published a report in GeoHealth enumerating the health co-benefits realized from transitioning to non-carbon forms of energy. So will you tell us a little bit about these health co-benefits and what are we talking about? How long does it take to realize these benefits? Because I think this is a message we really need to get out to the public and to our policymakers. Absolutely, Lisa, happy to. If you look at the literature, the literature will quote anywhere from one week to 25 years of saying the benefits of climate change. We see almost instantaneously a decrease in deaths related to ischemic heart disease, of uh, uh, COPD, which is a lung defect, and a decrease in stroke. I think we saw from the studies they did on air pollution in Atlanta, Georgia, during the Olympics, just over 17 days, we saw a substantial decrease in the number of hospitalizations hospitalizations and ER visits related to asthma. There's another study that looks at just over weeks, the amount of school absenteeism that you see from um, asthmatics having to be in the hospital, the mortality and premature births for those that are pregnant. So those are things that I think we will see within weeks. So weeks is, you know, a really a small amount of time. If you then go into months, we begin to see almost a two to 5% decrease in mortality at about seven months, which is substantial substantial. If we think about it, we've had 3.8 million deaths prematurely, we can decrease that by 2.5% is substantial. Then when we get into years, we really talk about the cost benefit. At 25 years, we begin to see that cost benefit at about a 32 to one ratio in terms of the benefit of the changes that we see in decreasing or reducing or eliminating even maybe um, the effects of climate change. So there are lots of co-benefits, some which we see relatively quickly, uh, but the financial part we'll see later, but the health of our community will be better within in days days to weeks to months, um, if we can make these differences. Thanks, Yvonne. That is such a powerful story, I think. And I, I hope the audience agrees. And I hope it's one that you take to your members of Congress. Um, Priscilla, we got to talk a little bit about carbon pricing. So according to the Columbia Center on Global Energy Policy, the uh, Energy Innovation Act would lower the concentration of the building blocks of air pollution between 75 and 95% by 2030. Yet many frontline communities are skeptical of a market approach to, like carbon fee and dividend. Being sensitive to those concerns, Senators Whitehouse and Schatz went one step further in their bill that they introduced the Save Our Future Act, or SOFA, to include not only a steadily increasing fee on greenhouse gas emissions, but also a fee at the source, uh, kind of midstream on the building blocks of air pollution, sulfoxide, nitrous oxide, and uh, fine particulate matter. Can you tell us why you feel comfortable with carbon fee and dividend policies in general? And what do you think about a fee placed on air pollutants like uh, was done in the Save Our Future Act? Okay, 
So I, Lisa, can you hear me? It was taking me a minute to unmute. Okay, so um, one of the things I appreciate most about the carbon fee and dividend approach is the fact that it's pricing pollution, point blank simple. Um, beyond that, I would say that historically, the fact that with a carbon fee and dividend, there's not that secondary trading market approach, I think that's great as well. So carbon fee and dividend impacting polluters of all size and not doing what cap and trade would do, which is maybe just um, impose on the bigger polluters, carbon fee and dividend is recognizing that big and small polluters collectively should be held accountable. And unlike cap and trade, there's no room for allowances with that carbon fee and dividend. So those price points are more predictable and business owners are less concerned about those fluctuating prices. So that's something else that makes me very comfortable with it. Something I've said in a lot of rooms, and I'm trying to move quickly for the sake of time, something I've said in a lot of rooms is that the people who bear the greatest burden but have the, less, the least impact um, contributing towards the climate crisis, why should they have to then bear the financial burden as we make the transition? But the guiding principle I feel beyond a carbon fee and dividend approach is limiting corruption that would allow big polluters to loop their way out of that, dishing out those equal payments or the dividend back to every household. And at the same time, we have to address that sore spot. The sore spot being that noticeably, when I say get the equal dividend back, we're leaning more into equality than the equity component. And whereas equality is treating us all the same, we do still have to acknowledge that not everyone is at the same starting point in this race because of a variety of factors unjust policy, circumstances beyond our control that started years before we were even born generationally, societal injustices that continue on. So for this reason, carbon pricing, using that carbon fee and dividend, it's not the entire answer for me, but it's a very important piece of the puzzle. And what I love about CCL is how it, how it embraces carbon fee and dividend as a policy that can be complemented by other policies once again, being more yes and, and embracing that variety of policy perspectives to, to do the most good, really. So also speaking for the sake of time, as far as SOFA, I think that targeting those emission reductions in EJ communities in that green economy transition, I think it's great if it does what it sets out to do, um, which is what 36% of the funds going to low-income energy assistance. I think it's 25% towards that weatherization assistance. 13% towards clean energy grants that would benefit EJ communities. I think that's setting a high standard for putting your money where your mouth is when it comes to building equity while creating a healthier climate and curbing emissions. And I'll stop there. That's beautiful, Princel. So we're really um, running short on time. And um, there's two questions in the chat that I can answer. I think you guys can answer pretty quickly. And then I really want to get to our very last question about the future. So um, I wonder, um, one question was, can you speak about the increase in severity of pollens and their adverse effects? Um, are you comfortable with that, Yvonne? Oh, sure, I can take it at, at a high level. So we know that um, pollens directly have been directly correlated with what we're seeing related to climate change. And the fact that we are seeing pollen seasons that are much earlier than normal, um, there are counts that are much higher than they have been, and the seasons are, 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 are lasting much longer. Um, so when we look at it, I think last year, the pollen counts, the, the costs related to sort of the medications around pollen costs were extremely high. So there's a direct correlation um, there also that that is one of the additional contributors, not only to air pollution, but also compromised health. And the number of, you know, high pollen days in the mm -hmm. northern hemisphere has just gone up and up and up as temperatures warm. Um, and then this is a harder question, at least it would be for me. How are premature deaths due to air pollution determined? And how can we better refer to this research and use it in our grassroots grass work? So I, I think, at least for the literature that I've seen, everybody has has defined their methodology differently. Um, I I would say I would start with perhaps the the smallest and more exact study where they looked at really 
pre the Atlanta Olympics and post the Atlanta Olympics. I think that was a really good controlled study where they were able to look at which folks in the population were going to ERs. They had a controlled environment of changing what the environment was in terms of air pollution. I'm not sure if you guys know but they cut off transportation to a particular area. So there was no vehicular um, air pollution, which is a large source of population. Um, they limited the number of buses used, but um, buses were used instead of cars. So I think all of that contributed to it. And they were then able to look at that same population that been, had been high utilizers of the ER or hospital system and that lived around that same area and then said, and, and it could be some extrapolation, but I, I think it, it's indeed true um, that because of those um, interventions put in place around controlling the population of the Olympics, we were able to also control air pollution, which then controlled um, the symptoms related to asthma and lung disease. I think that's the most controlled. I'm happy to answer that further. I can give you actually some of the methodology from studies. Um, when you get into um, the levels of in the soil or in the water, EPA has done, done a lot of studies looking at communities and have attributed to that, but I'm not sure I could answer that in the amount of time we have, but happy to cut those blurbs out and send them out. Well, that would be wonderful. Thanks so uh, much. And um, yeah. Okay. Uh, we unfortunately uh, lost uh, Rachel because of the weather and she couldn't hear things. And so um, she's moved on. But I want to ask this one last question, if I can find it. Um, and uh, I'd like to reflect on the words of Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson who asked this question, and I love this question. What if we get it right? The beauty of climate solutions is that they are health solutions. So would either of you wanna talk a little bit uh, or make a comment about what it would mean to those disproportionately impacted communities if we actually got it right? What would it look like and how can we aspire to achieve that? Having this conversation is one step there. I think for folks to understand really not only the effects that it's having on our environment, but the effects that it's having on health is substantial. For me, getting it right is seeing the disparities for any disease, but let's just take those related to climate change of of asthma and lung cancer and the disparities that we see in the black and brown populations disappear. I would say that's getting it right. Where we no longer see those disparities would be amazing. Um, getting it right is no longer I having to have my conversation with a patient who lives in a compromised neighborhood and has lead paint and mold in their homes and can't afford to move. The landlords won't do anything. The government won't do anything. Getting it right is equal housing for all, all of our populations. Um, one last step, getting it right would mean that I can live in any community and I would have access to walkways and bike paths as opposed to some areas in Chicago or right outside of Chicago where there's nowhere for folks to walk. So you want me to get out and exercise, but I don't have a path and it's safety. I'll, I'll take those three. For me, those if we could do those things, I would say we're getting it right. That's beautiful. Aban, I mean, Consel? Um, I would say, I'm going to say a bit about redlining in here too. And sorry, Lisa, that I didn't address that in full earlier. Um, That's great. So I would say that health and other disparities that we recognize from the climate crisis really acknowledge in what um, Dr. Collins just said, but also that lessened access to transportation, high quality education, food and healthcare in under-resourced communities of color and those homeless populations, we trace that back we can go back to systematic racism and redlining easily. So knowing that black people comprising 13% of the general population, but accounting for 39% experiencing homelessness, those numbers represent triple the inequities and redlining widen that wealth gap by denying home and business loans, divesting from black and brown communities. And if we get it right, that will go away because it's still here now. And the resulting poverty is not just what created more homelessness and people of color living in communities more exposed to environmental toxins and pollutions, even when you can afford not to live in those areas, we're still being denied rent, uh, access to rent in certain spaces, given higher rental fees um, that they can loop out of by calling it negotiable fees, making sure that it's not rented out to people of color. And as this cycle keeps going, 
Um, this is exacerbating rates of homelessness and the fact that it still is here after all this time and there's so much we can do. I feel like getting it right is saying, let's just do it and no longer opting out. Um, so I found this question very personal as well and answering it from a personal place, getting it right would mean um, I don't have to worry all the time about getting sick and getting sick enough to have to go to the hospital because I'm still dealing with health complications from where I grew up being exposed to environmental violence. And if I did go to the hospital, I'd be treated with the same level of consideration and care as a white person. Getting it right for me would be a collaborative mindset where we're learning from each other and we're having honest conversations about um, not just what lives matter, but because the right systems are in place, everyone's life gets to matter and it shows. And in that sense, children of all races and socioeconomic backgrounds, they can play together in biodiverse parks. They can drink water from the tap without getting sick just from breathing or wanting to take a drink. And we could all just stand beside each other with a shared focus towards the common goal of healing our planet and ourselves. And that's my answer. Sorry if it was a little too long. It was not at all too long. And it was just so, so beautiful. Um, I... You know, one the one only thing I would add that I thought was just interesting is we did a, a webinar on uh, decarbonizing healthcare, and uh, Dr. Parna Bowl, who's um, uh, 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 I think she's a pediatrician. She's she was at Ohio State University, and she's done she's been really in the forefront of a lot of this work. And she was asked, "What would be the single most important thing to be helpful in decarbonizing healthcare?" And it was uh, access to healthcare, preventative medicine, that people could all get in and get the care that they need early on. So we don't have to have these, so we don't need you, Yvonne. <laughs> so we don't <laughs> have to have the complicated surgeries. Um, and we would save so much and the quality of life would be so much better. Um, so we're at the end of our time. We had two uh, very involved questions that I just didn't feel that we can handle fully here, but we will take them and do our best to answer them. And I'll put them in the forum of the health action team so that you guys get a chance to see them. The answers, that's where they'll be on community and the forum. And I just wanna say what an honor it was for me to work with you two and to, um, you know, just learn from you. Um, and thanks to the audience for making it here. I hope you got as much out of this as I did. And I think uh, in about 15 minutes, there's gonna be um, a plenary lecture at the end. Uh, don't hesitate to email any one of us to um, carry on the conversation. And thank you very, very much. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. Like what you hear? Recommend us to your friends and make sure to give us a five-star rating. It helps us show up on other listeners' feeds. Feel free to pass on any suggestions for future episodes in the comments as well. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.